I, I really want to talk to you about leadership because I believe that each and every one of us, life rises and falls on leadership. And I know in the church, unfortunately, we've been so conditioned to believe that leadership is only being a minister, pastor, or an elder. And so we have just reduced leadership to say it only works in church. When in actuality, leadership is wherever you go, you are a leader. You're an influencer. You influence things. If you want to change a city, you need leaders to do it, not worship leaders, not pastors. You need influencers to do that. So I've been teaching a series called I'm Salty. It's dealing with the idea of Jesus saying to his disciples, you are to be light and you are to be salt. Salt influences whatever it touches. Those being baptized today, this is going to be your time to influence whomever you come in contact with. I believe that God has anointed you and I to be influencers. How I many of you believe that? Say amen. Say it like you ate breakfast. Say amen. Yeah, I believe God has anointed us to be influencers. Influencers over culture. We're not going to change the world by just having great church. We're going to change the world by going into the marketplace. We're going to change the world by buying up real estate and converting it and making it into things that are beneficial for the kingdom of God and for humanity. Tuesday, I want to talk about this a little bit too, about the saving grace for a lot of us is going to be group economics. Hello? Let me, let me tell you. What you can't do by yourself, you can do with another. I'm working on something, and uh, we're, we're working on something to where that a group of, I, I want to prove this, that it can happen. So I have a group of my friends, we're buying up property in a neighborhood, and we're going to, at the end of it all, if we do it right, we can own 20% of that entire neighborhood. Because, no, no, I didn't say I was buying it. I said, we got together and said, you buy one with me. And then y'all buy one together because the saving grace of our community is going to be group economics. The reason why we can't grow is because we can't unify and say who's willing to be second and who's not willing to be first. All right, well, we're learning this is not part of the message. This is part of Tuesday that you should be here. I said, well, Pastor, how did y'all, how y'all not ruin your friendship? You have legal contracts. that protect the friendship. This is how we're gonna operate. All right, anyway, let me, let me move on. Y'all don't wanna hear that. Y'all just wanna hear it. It's, it's gonna be your time. Shout, it's gonna be your time. And you've been shouting 15 years, it still ain't your time. At some point, you gotta say, you know what, I wanna hold manifestation in my hand. I, I don't want to just shout about what God's about to do. I want to experience what God is doing. I want to be at the closing table and dancing. And I, what you dancing about? I heard in church that it was my time. I just saw right here that it's my, my time. I want to read Genesis chapter number 45 for you. We've been walking through Joseph's life for a minute. And Joseph, at this point of the story, for those of you who haven't been here, you can pick up with us. Um, and I don't want to assume everybody knows who Joseph is because we have a biblical culture that does not know the Bible stories like we grew up in the old church. But Joseph was a person who was a type of Christ. His name is Joseph. His name means increase. He's a foreshadowing of Jesus. He's betrayed by his brothers. Jesus also betrayed by his brothers. God allows him to go through all of these things for one reason, for him to change a culture and save his own brother. In Genesis 45, he gets, in Genesis, he gets sold out by his brother. His brothers sell him out. They want to kill him. They betray him. They sell him. He gets thrown into Potiphar's world. Potiphar's a powerful king. He puts him in charge of everything. And then all of a sudden, Potiphar's wife wants him, lies, and says that he 
has been trying to talk to her, holler at her, seduce her, all these things. He gets thrown into prison for two years. Potiphar has a dream, needs it interpreted. One of the guys in the jail realized that Joseph had a dream and said, oh snap, two years ago I met a dude in prison. His name is Joseph, he interprets dreams. So then the king brought him out, he interpreted his dream. The king restored Joseph back to where he was. Listen, there's a lot of, whenever God restores you, you go through a lot of trauma too. We gotta stop preaching this God restoration without the trauma part. Right? There's a lot of trauma in Job losing all of his children and then getting double. The double don't replace what he lost. All right, when we read the life of Jacob in the passage, Jacob is Joseph's father. Jacob was a trickster. Jacob believes, this is all messed up, Jacob believes that his son has been dead for seven multiple years. He doesn't know his son is alive. So now Joseph realizes my brothers are coming up, 45. Verse number four, his brother sold him out. He's in position. There's a famine that's happening in his brother's house with the dad. And then they're all of a sudden all messed up. They need food because food was everything. That's how you traded. That's how you live. So he calls his brothers. I can start my clock. He calls his brothers and says, um, the brothers come and they go to Egypt because they need food. Joseph realizes that these are his brothers that betrayed him. But they don't realize it's him. Because here's what you got to realize, when you get elevated, it changes who you are, even who you look like. Because when you've been exposed, you act different because of your exposure. Joseph has been exposed to how kings live. He's been exposed to how royalty lives. He's been exposed to how wealthy people live. He ain't acting like he's back in the hood. That don't mean the hood ain't in him if you don't if you try him. It simply means that because he's been exposed, his level of comprehension is much different than everybody else. It's not that you change, it's that you've been exposed. So verse 4 says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves. Here's the verse, y'all for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So maybe all you're experiencing is God trying to help you save someone else's life. Remember, being a leader to lead people out of captivity means you got to be a drink offering for them. Remember, I always said Martin Luther King was not really loved until he was killed. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save lives by great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but who? Ooh, that's some hard stuff to reconcile. You mean I got thrown into jail and all the church would say the devil did it? And God would say, no, nah, I did it. <laughs> he made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord over all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen. And this is where during a pandemic you heard people talking about, I'm going to live in Goshen, I'm not going to live in a famine. Goshen was a place that was recession proof. There was no way that recession can touch Goshen because of the type of land it was. And Potiphar gives Joseph's family the entire place. Now I want to talk to you for a small moment of time. The disadvantage of advantage. There is a disadvantage to having advantage. We, we can clearly see when a basketball team, a football team, a boxer feels that they have the advantage, they become quite lax in their approach. They assume in areas that they would be more cautious because they feel they can rely on their advantage. How can you say there is a disadvantage to advantage? Leadership speaking, those who are in power have an advantage 
but must be careful not to use their power as a rod of oppression. Joseph has finally got to a place where he is winning and all those who harmed him have to come see him. He can use his advantage to lord over or he can use his advantage to broaden his vantage point. I believe many of us in this room desire a table in the presence of our enemies only to lord over them because we now have the advantage. I'm salty is not about feeling indifferent, it's about influence, it's about leadership. Jesus said, be light and salt. How you lead as a supervisor, boss, CEO, manager, employee, when you have the advantage over the likelihood of others. Do you use your advantage as salt or is it to your advantage to use it as a sour posture? Managing, this is important y'all, managing and passing the heart test was always what Joseph had to pass to get to the next level. Can you see your brothers and not kill them? Even though you'd be justified, you got to pass the heart test. Many of us have not gotten promoted because we haven't passed the heart test. The heart test is the hardest test to pass as a leader. To know those that betrayed you, you still cool with. Some of y'all like, the pastor, I was with you until you said that. No, there is a disadvantage to advantage because you feel like you have the right to take advantage of those who took advantage of you. But Joseph used his advantage to give them favor, food, and direction. I want to give you some principles from the life of Joseph that I think will be helpful in any space that you're in, whether you're a boss, CEO, first-time Christian, long-term Christian, leader, business coach, mentor, pastor, worship leader, whatever. I think it will be helpful for you on your journey of leadership. Let me just start off by telling you with the first punch that you'll get is that winning does not erase your wounds. Because a lot of you have built up, and a lot of us have built up this idea that once I win, I'm good. But if you look at Joseph and you follow the story, he's constantly crying and breaking down because even though he won, he's still wounded. And your wins don't erase your wounds. Some of you feel, once I get the crib, I'll be straight. Once you get the crib, you'll get the crib and be wounded with the crib. Once I get the car, I'll be happy. You'll get the car, be happy for a season, and still be wounded. Because wins don't erase wounds. So here's what Joseph had to do when he saw his brothers. As a leader, you got to learn how to do this, and we all are leaders. If you're parents, you're a leader. You have to learn how to make decisions off principles, not off of personal preference. Joseph could have said, you know what, I'm going to kill y'all because I got it now. I finally got the opportunity to get you back. You might want to write down, make decisions off principles, not off of preference. Sometimes my personal preference violates my principles. Because my personal preference would say, well, if they sold you into slavery, you need not to give them any food and see how they like it. But that's not the principle of being a good leader. And I know a lot of you have horror stories. I've heard them. And if people would listen to your stories, you watch it on YouTube. I know. You on Facebook Live. I know. You got stories that if you told the room, they would stand and say, man, I can't believe you went through that. But here's what I have learned and here's what Joseph has taught us, that you cannot choose to harm those that hurt you. Healing is not in revenge, but in the release. Healing is not in the revenge, it's in the release. Now what you mean, Pastor, uh, um, um, forgiveness is, is not about, it's, it, forgiveness honestly is not about them. Because here's what you and I got to get to the point of understanding. 
Just because you want an apology from the person that offended you doesn't mean the apology will make you feel good. So it's not, it's not about, it's, it's not about harming those that hurt you. It's about getting healed from those that hurt you. Because whatever you don't heal from, you will then repeat yourself. You ever see predators become that have been molested end up molesting others? And you're like, well, if you knew how it was to have that happen to you, why would you then in turn do it to somebody else? Because what you don't heal from, you eventually end up becoming. I'll never do that to anybody. And then you find yourself doing the thing that you said you'll never do to anybody else. And in leadership, if you learn, Joseph taught us this very carefully. Punishing the powerless doesn't make you powerful. It makes you prideful. You want to type that in the comments? Punishing the powerful doesn't make you punishing. Punishing the powerless doesn't make you powerful. It makes you prideful. Oh, his brothers are sitting there as lame ducks. They're a perfect sacrifice at that moment. And instead of punishing them, he releases them because he understands that if I punish you, it doesn't make me powerful, it makes me prideful. And I can't afford to be prideful because I'm trying to get to where God is trying to take me. Y'all know that um, as a leader, right, um, we are followers of Jesus. That's what discipleship means. That's what being a Christian means. It means to follow Jesus. And our slogan is follow God, love people, change the city. Um, if Jesus had a hole in his wrist and they pierced his side where they pierced his heart, sack, and water ran out, you are aware then that if Jesus had a hole in his heart as a leader, you will have a hole in your heart as a leader because we all have holes that only God can fill. That's why success can't fill it. That's why you're like, man, I keep hearing you say these things and I don't necessarily believe it's true. Like, I don't believe you, Pastor. I believe if I was rich, I would be so much happier. And I can tell you by meeting a whole lot of people who have a whole lot of resources that resources don't always determine happiness. Because if your hole is big and all you're doing is trying to consume it to get it healthy, it's not going to be healthy. So let's keep going. Here, here it is, y'all. Joseph realized harming my brothers would give me temporary peace but long-lasting emotional damage. Because think about it. You finally get to pay your brothers back and you kill them, you ain't never going to be able to live with yourself. You got back at him, but you hurt yourself in the long run. Now, how many of you really winning because you're killing people that you should release? You killed them and you're like, yeah, they tried me. I done blocked their career. I done blocked everything, but you harmed yourself emotionally. Now you can't be loved because you don't know what love is, and now you're damaged, and now people got to spend their entire days fixing you because you're so broken. And so now you finally got to the place you've been dreaming of, but you're so broken you can't enjoy it. Now you can't win. <laughs> Y'all ready? Betrayal is the payment for the courage to lead people out of captivity. All of you who are game changers, influencers, talking about, I'm going to change the world, I'm going to change myself, I'm going to change my family. Well, then you're signing up to be betrayed. Because throughout scripture, there's no one and throughout history that's never tried to change something and not gotten betrayed by the people they try to help. No, the, the knife that you think is coming from your haters is not coming from your haters. It's coming from someone at your table. But you got to learn how to live through it. Any great leader will teach you, you got to learn how to live through betrayal. Because if you don't live through betrayal, you'll become jaded and not like Jesus. How many of you ever been betrayed? Raise your hand, raise your hand. 
Doesn't it hurt? Isn't it painful? Doesn't it shape how you view things? It turns your innocence. And some of you have become monsters because you've been betrayed. You, it's not that you don't want to be married. You just don't trust anybody. And before you give yourself to somebody, you create a relational dysfunction so that you can justify betraying them. That's why it's important that you just don't blow up without growing up. And I know everybody in our culture speaks to your blowing up and they speak to your success and they speak to the person that's making it. But here's the reality. Just because you're a king doesn't mean you're not a kid. Oh, baby girl, don't think just because you're married, you think you're a wife and really your husband married just a daughter that really didn't want to get married. She just wanted a father. And because she didn't have a father, she chose you. That's why it's so important that we grow up before we blow up. <laughs> Here it is. Hmm. This is kind of hard to process, but I heard it said, but I think it's re really going to be hard to process this. I mean, think about Joseph, you would think like, man, you got a lot of things going on. You got your brothers that betrayed you, felt betrayed by Potiphar who threw you in jail because of his wife. Your father now, you don't know if he's alive or dead. You ask your brothers to find out if your dad was alive, found out he's alive, you're excited that he's alive. But in all of those times when you were sitting in prison for two years and you were in prison not because of anything you did wrong but because of something you did right, and you didn't defend yourself even though you were right, which teaches us a leadership principle that sometimes you'll lose if you defend yourself and you'll lose if you stay quiet. But there is a powerful truth to this that Joseph learned that silence can't be misquoted. All right. Sometimes your feelings will seduce you into loving a season and not the person you're supposed to become. Let me say that again. Your feelings could seduce you into loving a, a your feelings could seduce you into loving a temporary season and making you feel like this is the person you are to become. Man, I'm tired of people trying me. The next person that tries me, I'm going to set it off. And you know that ain't even you. But because your feelings seduce you into loving a season, you make yourself become that person. You got to resist the urge to become what you hate. Here it is. This text, they did not recognize Joseph when they saw him because Joseph had a different look. He, he was in a class by himself at this stage. And you start to recognize these things when you're in these classes. God will, here's what I want to tell you. When God, when God, whatever God lets you go through, he will introduce you to someone that will take you further than the last season took you. <laughs> okay. Whenever, whenever God wants to take you further, he will introduce you to a person that will take you further than the last season took you. Now, let, let me, let me kind of make it make a little sense. You don't have to tell people what you need. God will send you what you need because the people that need to find you will recognize what you need. Y'all missed it. Okay, let me help you catch it again. All right. So I, I, went, to, I, went, to, I went to the store um, years ago. I went to the Ferragamo store, and I wanted some shoes. And I was probably... Um, maybe 25, and I went to the guy and I said, you know, man, if you spend this type of money, you want people to know. 
you want to at least to say the name or something that people could know that this is what I paid for. You know, ain't no sense of buying something real expensive and no one know what it is. Don't look at me like that because I see you take your pictures and you lift the bottom of your foot to make sure people see it's red. It just, the red done faded away, but you need, I need you to see that it's red, right? So, so I, 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 I was there and, and the guy looked at me and he, he, he said, sir, I, I've been selling Ferragamo shoes for almost 20 years. He said, the people who actually wear these shoes, when they look at them, they already know. Come on, church. He, he said, the people who need to know will know. The people who don't need to know, even if you told them, they still wouldn't have an understanding because they ain't in this class. And when God is trying to take you to another dimension, the people who need to know will find you because they will recognize within your eyes there's another season that you need to go to and you need their experience and expertise to take you where your feet has never been but your heart has been a long time ago. So maybe our prayer should stop being, Lord, give me a bigger house. Lord, give me a bigger car. And maybe it should be, Lord, meet me with somebody that can give me an instruction that will take me to where my heart has been, but my feet have never been. And Joseph realized that when God shuts a door because your brothers betray you, God will raise up a stranger to take care of you, which teaches you a principle that you want your friends to pray promote you and all the time most of the time God will use strangers he'll use strangers he'll use strangers he tells his brothers listen um Send for my younger brothers, because the dad said, I'm only keeping my youngest brother, Simeon, I'm, I'm a Reuben, I'm going to keep my youngest son here. All the rest of y'all go out there, because if, if y'all end up getting killed, I can't afford to lose my last son. That's what Jacob says. And man, I want to teach a series on this, man, on grief. He spent all these years thinking his son was dead, his son was never dead. He ends his life saying this, I can't afford to have another bad thing happen to me because I've lost so much already. And if you don't, if you don't grieve well, you don't heal well. He spends his entire life thinking about his, his entire ending of his life, thinking about what he lost. And he says this, it's one of the verses in there. He says, God has brought me through a hard life. Some of you have had a hard life. There's no way you can explain how hard it's been. You can't even understand why God picked you to go through the things you went through. Remember I always say we don't understand seasons while we're in them. We understand seasons when we come out of them. If you don't understand a season while you're in it, you understand the season when you come out of it. So he says, send for your brother. And I'm almost done. I can tell y'all want chicken and waffles. So here it is. It says, send for your brother. Um, send for your brother because I want to see him. Um, but he said, all of this that I've experienced, don't be mad at yourself. It, it was for God who sent me ahead of you to preserve your lives. That's a powerful thing. God will send you ahead of everybody else. But the payment for promotion in God's kingdom, every, every person you see, the payment for promotion in God's kingdom is pain. Now, can I give you perspective? In Jesus' day, if God was elevating you in Jesus' day, you would get stoned. Let me back it up. If God was elevating you in Jesus' day, you would get crucified. 
Okay. If God was elevating you in Jesus' day, you'd, you'd get nails put in your hands. Back it up. If God was elevating you in Jesus' day, your whole family could get burned up. Oh, uh, if God was elevating you in Jesus' day, your whole livelihood could be destroyed. In today's culture, the exchange that God is giving you for what you're getting is peanuts compared to what others experienced. They're talking about me on social media. I'll take that any day than being crucified. They're texting about me. I'll take that any day than being boiled alive. We have to realize that God's greatest gift to the world is leadership. One of God's greatest gifts is leadership. But the making of a leader is not an overnight process, it's a process of a lifetime. When you have better information, you make better picks. When you have better information, you make better decisions. I wanna close for real, for real, and pray with you all. Cause some of you are so hurt by life that you're taking your hurt and projecting it on your brothers and your sisters because yes, you have the right to be hurt, but you don't have the right to bleed on people who didn't hurt you. Say it again. You have the right, Joseph, to be hurt, but you don't have the right to bleed on people who didn't hurt you. come home, you, you kicking everything over. Your wife's like, what, what did I do? The people at the job make me upset. Well, why am I paying for what they did? Your husband's saying, well, I ain't cooking today. I had a bad day at work. If you cook, not saying that all women have to cook, but if that's the role that you take, why is he paying for an experience that you had that has nothing to do with him? That's, that's the gift of being a great leader, is learning how not to let other people pay for what someone else did. Remember how many of you grew up in a household where the parents beat all the kids for doing something wrong? All y'all getting beat. It's like, well, why I gotta get beat? I didn't do anything wrong. Like we all, so we all gonna get a whooping. So next time I might as well do it if we all gonna get a whooping. We're just going to whoop everybody. A kid was sleeping the whole day. He got whooped for sleeping. He didn't even know what happened. We got to learn as leaders how not to make other people pay for what someone else did. Yes, use it to be vigilant, but don't use it as weaponry. Y'all understand that? You may not get it right the first time. You may not get it right the second time. But let me just tell you, every day as a leader is a work in progress. You who are getting baptized, you're influencers. All baptism is, is like a wedding. It's just publicly saying we're getting married. We love each other. When couples get married, they've been in love. The altar is just a public declaration that they're serious about their commitment. And now it's your time to be Christians and influence the world. No, you don't influence the world by walking in the stores, laying hands on people. You're not going to change the world by walking around. No, you're going to change the world by you being spiritual and God giving you wisdom and saying, you know what, I see something in you and I just want to pray with you about what I see. You're going to change the world by God giving you a gift. I'm a gift to sell things. If that's your gift, let God glorify your life in it. Let me pray with you that we'll be so salty, you'll change the world. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you that it's true that we have to be salty to change the world. I pray that we don't become salty instead of being the salt that changes the world. 
So Holy Spirit, help my brother, help my sister. Help us grow in grace. Help us learn how to lead. Help us learn how to grow as leaders. You walk the earth and you change the earth because you are a great leader. And Jesus, we pray today that we'll be as great as a leader as you are. It's in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.